Welcome to the station of decapitation without your head. I'm Nasty Neal, and I'm joined by legendary horror actress Judy Matheson. It's very cool to have you here. Hello, it's wonderful to be here. I'm chatting to you all the way from London, UK. Yeah. You know, actually, is that uh, was that ever surprising to you that, like, uh, so you make a lot of movies, uh, British horror movies, and then, you, you know, people are still talking about them, and people all over the world watch them? Definitely, now, absolutely, absolutely. The fact that a lot of them have become cult is extraordinary for me. I find it very, very extraordinary. I just did them all, you know, what, 40 years ago, maybe 30, 40 years ago, and, um, you know, one never thought, I was just a jobbing actress, one never, ever thought that uh, they would be remembered and uh, treated as cult and um, very much loved. Mm -hmm. It is extraordinary. Yeah. Every when day, did... it's extraordinary. When did, it's extraordinary yeah. to be talking to you, Neil, all the way oh. from London, yeah, about been, things I did all those years ago. Uh huh. Yeah, it is. This is very. It's great to talk to you. The uh, um, when did you realize that that the the movies had was it right away that they had the following? I'm sure they had a following to begin with, but like when did you realize that they still had you know such a following and became cult movies? Well, it, it wasn't really straight away. You just went from one job to the other. There was no social media, which is huge, of course, with all this. And so you didn't realize how much things were enjoyed. Um, also, I mean, then I uh, stopped working. I went to work uh, as a television continuity announcer. And then I got married and had children. And then I went to South Africa for about 12 years to live. So when I came back, um, it was astonishing for me to see on the internet that all these things were so popular. That was the most surprising thing. When I came back from South Africa, I had absolutely no idea. And that was probably in about, um, it, it was in the early 2000s that I came back and saw pictures of me on the internet and films that I'd done and people commenting. And uh, before long, in fact, I think my first one was in 2013, but um, people were asking me to go to conventions and, um, and talk to people, which was astonishing. Still is astonishing, Neil, to be honest. Yeah. So when you're at the conventions, like wh what are like the, a the age range of fans? Because obviously a lot of them probably, you know, uh, were born after the movies were made. Yeah, no, no, that is quite interesting because I get asked that from time to time and everybody thinks it's sort of people who uh, loved them at the time, but you get a lot of young people. I get a lot of young people that's often students doing, um, um, you know, PhDs and things on British uh, films of the 50s, 60s and 70s. And uh, a lot of young people are very, very interested. So the age range is huge. It's from, um, I've had actually 12-year-olds turn up who uh, like my movies, surprisingly, um, to obviously old people as well. Mm -hmm. So it's huge. Yeah. My uh, friends, Michael Epstein and Sophia Cassiola, who make uh, independent movies, they made Blood of the Tribids a few years ago, which was a, uh, a vampire movie. And they attributed uh, your scene in Twins of Evil being one of the one of the bigger the big um, inspirations for the movie. And they also mentioned that you actually donated to their campaign when they made the movie. Oh, how interesting! Yes, no, that, that I remember that. I absolutely remember that. That was quite an extraordinary film, particularly in retrospect. I mean, scene to do because I had no idea it was going to be the pre-credit sequence at the time. I was just thrilled to be doing a couple of days filming with Peter Cushing. And, um, I, you know, I was just thrilled to be doing it. And it seems now to have become quite an iconic little scene from the Hammer, Twins of Evil, which is extraordinary. Yeah. Mm -hmm. he, was, well, um, he was, sorry, I was just going to say he was slated to do the lead in the first Hammer film I did, which was Lust for a Vampire. Mm -hmm. uh, but his wife got very ill, so he withdrew. Um, so he withdrew and, and didn't do the part. But then after she died... Twins of Evil was the first film he did after after he'd lost his beloved wife. Oh. So what was he like then on set? Because, you know, obviously that would be a, a hard time for him. It was a hard time. Um, I think I'd been warned not to be my usual boisterous self, that he was not feeling, you know, he was, he, was, he was very quiet. He was very dignified. He was quite conversational. He was, what was extraordinary about him at that time, and I'm going back a long time, obviously, now, but he was very interested in me and um, chatted about my life and, you know, who I was and where I'd come from. And he didn't talk very much about himself, but um, he was an extraordinary actor because he was such a gentle, quietly spoken man. And, um, you know, as soon as the uh, director called action, he, um, 
you know, he just changed instantly. He changed completely. And he's playing a very unpleasant person in Twins of Evil. And um, I was playing opposite him. He was quite terrifying. It was uh, wonderful to work with. Mm -hmm. Now, were you uh, interested in horror movies before you started to play in them? No, not particularly. <laughs> Yeah. No, not particularly at all. I just went where the money was, where the offers were. Not all the offers. I didn't accept everything. But, um, mm -hmm. you know, it, I had a really, really good agent in the center of London who had a lot of the um, very dynamic young actors of the time on her books. And um, one was always very grateful and flattered, in fact, to be with this particular agent. And she would suggest you for things. And it would be work the usual way that actors do now. She'd suggest you for things people would see you, you would either like what they offered or you didn't like it or you didn't like the money or, or whatever. So I had no idea, really. I mean, I just did horror films. They seemed to be the, the thing to do. She seemed to get a lot of offers for it. The first thing I did was a horror film in Spain, in fact. And um, from then on, but there were lots of other things in my life, but people are not so interested in that. I mean, work-wise, there was theater, a lot of theater, a lot of um, television, things like that, cult television over here, in fact. Mm -hmm. um, yes, lots of quite serious things as well. I wasn't, um, I wasn't somebody who started off as a model and then got sort of seduced into films. I right. considered myself at the time quite a serious actress. Yeah. You mentioned that, you know, some of the other things um, people don't talk about. What, what is it about horror movies, do you think, that really stand like the test of time and people will talk about and, and then also discover like, uh, you know, new generations discover them? Yeah, there's a big there's a big difference. I think I think what what actually killed off the horror films, the Hammer type horror films in Britain, was the uh, advent of all your American horror films in the 80s, mm -hmm. and that that changed the genre really. I mean, they're all under the same a title, horror films, but they were very very different slasher films really from the 80s and the. Mm -hmm. uh, the, they got a different, they had a whole, whole different feel to them. I have no idea. I have no idea why people are fascinated by them. I can relate slightly more to the Hammer Horror because I think Hammer Horror um, did an awful lot with a very small budget. I mean, they, they looked magnificent. They used wonderful crews. They used some very good actors. And, and they were sort of quite glamorous. They were quite glamorous to even be in. They treated you very well as an actor. They send cards for you, and you were treated very well. Um, so, um, I, but I have no idea. You have to tell me, Neil. What is the fascination with horror uh, films? It is. It's interesting because I grew up watching. I I do like like all movies and lots of TV shows, not just horror stuff. But uh, it's interesting that a lot of those stick with people, and uh, even stuff I grew up watching. A lot of it, like. Uh, Unless it pops up, like I don't remember, but uh, for some reason, like the horror movies, even like sillier ones, like uh, 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 stick with you. And I'm not really sure the reason. It maybe is vicarious. It's just a vicarious thrill, I suppose. I mean, people tell me about that there were horror films, Hammer Horror and other horror films, shown on the BBC late at night, apparently, I've been told, on uh, as a regular thing, maybe Friday or Saturday nights. I'm not entirely sure when this was, maybe the 80s. And uh, grown men tell me how they used to creep down when their parents had gone to sleep and put these, and they, I'm talking about the BBC, the sort of state broadcaster here, yeah. would show, um, that there were a series of Hammer films, I think they showed, and other horror films, and they'd creep down and watch them when their parents were asleep so it starts from a very young age yeah. it is a vicarious thrill i think and the you know you're not actually um watching the murder or the the graphic sort of violence mm -hmm. but you're uh, part of it by watching yeah. it yeah it's like a, a little bit uh, a little bit of uh, you're a little bit close to the darkness but not an entirely actually yeah. in it yes that's much better than what i said yeah. <laughs> oh, no it works and then once it's over you're out of it so you don't have to worry exactly. about uh, anything happening to you. But yeah, I grew up, you know, in the uh, early 80s. And uh, uh, similar to Set of Hammer, though, you know, I'd watch a Universal horror movie. Mod and I'd record them on VHS tape and, you know, watch all those at night. The old Frankenstein yeah. and Dracula. Yeah, so. but also your things, your wonderful stuff, like The Exorcist and things like that. Mm -hmm. And all the teenage, the teenage thriller movies. In fact, my uh, my daughter's loved um, the the um, I can't think of the names now. You'll be able to remember them more. more yeah, like Friday the Thirteenth and yes, all those. Those were wonderful. Stuff. Yeah, 
Yes. It, it, another thing with horror, there's also a lot of different styles. It's not, you know, like you said, you could watch a hammer horror movie, which is more like classic gothic horror. And then you could watch, you know, like a slasher film. So, it, you know, depending what you're in, or like there's a lot of comedy in horror. So there's a lot of different, uh, a lot of different genres within within the genre. There is, but also there's a, a rather interesting phenomenon over here, whereby quite a lot of sort of very um, um, erudite uh, commentators, I mean, uh, uh, you know, sort of, a report, you know, people who write, writers really, have got really, really interested in the whole history of horror, particularly the hammer horrors, I should say, from Bram Stoker. There's been, I don't know if you know, and you'll, you will get it because it'll be on Netflix, I think, but have you seen, there's a new Dracula uh, movie yeah, I ha- yeah, I haven't watched it, but um, because I was uh, I wasn't home for a while. But the uh, a lot of people really love the first two episodes, and then the third episode, people are kind of split on. But um, that's exactly right. That's how, and that's exactly how it's taken over here. Yeah. Okay, because I think the third one, not to spoil it for anybody, but it takes place in modern day, so it's sort of. Yes, like, I, I've uh, read that too. I don't think you'll spoil it because I've read that too. I didn't actually see the second, the third one. But yeah. uh, after one of them, there was a documentary uh, about the history taken. For, it was shot in Bray Studios, where Hammer, Hammer um, did a lot of their um, films in the early days, and there was uh, there was a very very interesting documentary, and and people who have taken interest in in the history and um, and the films and the history of the films, in fact, um, you know, really. Um, very well thought of intellectual people. I'm, I'm very, very surprised that not only is it just cult viewers, it's also um, written about in quite profound terms. That surprises me too, I must say. Yeah. Well, there's a lot of, you know, great actors like Peter Cushing in, uh, you know, in the Hammer Horror movies. Christopher yes. Lee and, yeah. Christopher Lee, well, they were the two, of course. They're the two stars, basically. Mm-hmm. They're the ones that... Um, yeah, just just all the major stars. So you mentioned, you know, uh, Peter Cushing couldn't do Lust for Vampires, so Mike Raven is in that. You also work with him in uh, Crucible of Terror. I did, I did, but he he didn't. He, it was Ralph Bates who took the part that Peter Cushing oh, would have done. I see. Um, it, Mike Raven. I didn't actually come across Mike Raven in um, Lust for a Vampire, and I'm not entirely sure that when I shot. Um, crucible of terror with him that um, I can't remember ever discussing it with him to be honest I can't remember discussing that we had worked on the same movie before hmm. uh, the hammer horror yeah he, ha- he, he had I think quite a small part in in last uh, vampire didn't he I think he had quite a small part but he was also dubbed and also they used <laughs> sorry about laughing but they used Christopher Lee's eyes in a close-up so oh really? Um, yeah, and um, he was he was dubbed by a very famous British um, dubbing artist called Va- Valentine Dial, who had the most wonderful, deep, quite threatening voice. And so it isn't really Mike Raven you're seeing. He was dying to become a, a you know the next Christopher Lee, but he didn't really have the um, talent. Yeah. What was he like personally? Was he a nice guy or? Um, oh, Maybe so not. Difficult. Huh? Okay. Well, it's so difficult for me to say this, at, you know. Now I've written it a, a, a little bit or talked in interviews, but actually saying it, he he took himself too seriously. To be honest, he was not. We were working in Crucible of Terror. We were working with very, very good actors. Everybody in it was, you know, terrific. From the, even the smaller parts, uh, John Arnott and Betty Alberg and <clears throat> and um, Ronnie Lacey, and they were all terrific actors. And um, they had this sort of actor who took himself too seriously and didn't, wasn't, um, I don't know, he wasn't, he wasn't very humorous, uh, which was a shame because everybody else was having huge fun on the film. But um, no, that's all I can say is he took himself a bit too seriously. He, he, seemed, to, he seemed to have had a sense of humor bypass. Right. Uh, does, that, uh, does that affect... Uh like okay, so if someone is like uh, not easy to work with, is that uh, not necessarily easy, but not necessarily fun to be around? I guess. No, he just wasn't, he wasn't huge fun. No, and there were lots of fun, there was lots of fun on that film. It was actually a small budget film, um, and we did it, shot it in, in nice surroundings in Cornwall, and everybody was having fun, mm-hmm. to the extent, in fact, that the lead lady Mary Maud um, married the assistant director on it. They were getting on so well. Everybody was getting on really, really well, and um, 
yeah, no, I'm afraid um, he he didn't join in the fun so much. Yeah. He um he he I don't know. He just took himself too seriously. That's all I can say. Um, as I said, he's lacked a little bit of humour. Yeah. So when you first auditioned for your first horror movie, like how does that go? And since you not, I know you will look at him. This is you know a job, but uh, since it is a horror movie, like uh, did you prepare any differently for for something that that's a horror movie? No, not at all, but uh, not at all. And um, uh, the first film I ever did was actually really quite a serious film in Spain with a, with a very intellectual director. It was altogether um, very sort of, um, it was very uh, noirish. It was very, very European noir. It was a European noir. And he came over from Barcelona to audition. He auditioned a lot of uh, young women and um, then he cut it down, but I was, I was astonished to have been chosen. He came over with his lighting uh, cameraman, and, um, and finally I was in the shortlist, and then finally I was invited to go over to Barcelona and do the film. And that was just amazing for me, because it was, it was a lead. It, looking back, um, particularly, it had three amazing, strong parts for women, which is very, very unusual. It was quite a feminist movie, and, and especially for those days, and it was a wonderful movie to work on. Every, everybody was very, um, very bright, some wonderful mm-hmm. actors in it, and I thoroughly enjoyed that, and I was in Spain for about six months, and it was my first proper movie. I'd done a day on a Gregory Peck movie, but apart from that, it was my first movie. 69, 1969, so long ago. And um, I, I vaguely came back to London and just thought, this is how it is. You're going to be, you're going to be in glamorous films with cars picking you up and, and um, flying all over the world. And I thought that was how it was. Um, when I was sent by my agent to audition for Lust for a Vampire, in fact, I know I had... Um, an availability check for the first of the three, which just means they would have checked whether you could go for an audition for the vampire lovers. But I couldn't go for that. I don't know what I was doing, but I couldn't go. But then I was asked to go and meet the producers for Lust for a Vampire. I never met John Huff, and I honestly didn't realize there was a bit of a um, sort of performance going on back, back behind the scenes. First of all, Peter Cushing not doing it, and then sort of there was a little bit of difficulty of the production, I believe, but I was completely unaware of it. And all I did, I can't even remember reading for it. In fact, I wouldn't have read for it because I didn't have very much to say, but um, they liked me and offered me the part. And that's all it was. You just met the producers in that case. Normally you would meet the director, but I didn't meet John Huff. And also I think the director, in fact, I know the director was replaced at short notice as well. And I'm trying to remember it was... It was um, a wonderful actor, Terence, Terence, whatever his name is, sorry about that, can't remember his name, but he was a wonderful director of Hammer films, and he didn't do it, so John Huff also came in at the, at the last minute. So it was all a bit chaotic, I believe, but it wasn't as far as I was concerned. I went for, um, you know, it was just wonderful to be a young woman going for wonderful wardrobe fittings, choosing your dress, you know, deciding uh-huh. how your hair was going to be, makeup, you know, tests, and it was just wonderful. And mm-hmm. glamorous and gorgeous, and it was wonderful weather. We had wonderful um, surroundings to work in, and it, and there were lots of lovely young women that we all had fun with. Mm-hmm. Um, that's what it was. And for the next film, Twins of Evil, I was went to see the same uh, producers <clears throat> doing that, and they um, just offered me. They actually very kindly outlined the smaller parts in the film and said, "Which one do you fancy doing?" And um, I said, of course, I said, the, Peter, the one that has the scene with Peter Cushing. <laughs> uh-huh. I didn't read for it. I didn't see the script. I just said, that's what I'd like to do if you want to offer it to me. And uh, then, of course, they rang my agent. It was, uh, things are very different for actors now. You know, you had to ring your agent to see if you got a part. You didn't, mm-hmm. There was no uh, mobile phones, which must be wonderful to be an actor now when, you, when your agent will just call you wherever you are, <laughs> tell you you've got the part or you haven't got the part. But for us, it was like rushing home at night and seeing if you were lucky enough to have an answering machine, see if it was uh, flashing. And then it was flashing and you pick it up, hoping it was going to be your agent, um, leaving a message saying you'd got whatever job you'd, got for, you'd gone for. And sometimes it was and sometimes it wasn't. And um, so it was all very, very different in those days. Mm-hmm. Uh, but I was really pleased to be doing the Peter Cushing film. That was a thrill. 
And as I said to you earlier, I didn't realize it was going to be a credit sequence or a pre-credit sequence. I, don't, I can't even remember. It must have been in the script, I suppose. Um, as far as I was concerned, it was just a uh, scene in the film. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and if you, look up, yeah, if you look up the film, that's a, a lot of the images is, is you know, from that scene. Yes, definitely. Definitely. Also, if you watch it, the first, the first, I think it's four minutes, I think I've timed it almost to the last second. It's, um, it's four minutes and it's all the credits are going over my screaming. It was a very interesting, um, in, you know, looking back, it was a very interesting scene to do because uh, there were no, uh, no CGI or anything like that. So it was real film, uh, real flames, I mean, and, um, and it took quite a lot of doing. We didn't do it in many takes. I think we did it in one take. And I screamed and screamed and screamed for um, at least two minutes of those four minutes. And all, as you know, the credits go over them, but I didn't know that at the time. And, um, and when I stopped screaming, it was all absolutely silent except for my screaming. When I stopped screaming, uh, there was a silence on set. And then the entire crew clapped uh, into huge applause and i've never had a moment like that before or since it was uh, very gratifying it's pretty wild so how how close is the fire can you actually feel like the heat during the scene well no i don't know i can't remember it was just something that i did sure. i actually lots of people have asked me that uh, there was proper fire and i was properly doing it um but no i don't think it, I, i've never felt threatened mm. yeah. by the fire i never felt sure. unsafe yeah. Also filming I'm on. Quite, I'm not quite sure where the flames were. In you know, remembering it, I right. can't. I mean, it looks fantastic and it looks quite dangerous. They uh, they had a fire officer on set in case things got out of control. Mm-hmm. I was to say also. And Peter Cushing was wonderful. Cool. Though of course he wasn't in that actual scene of the of the. Uh, well, he was at the beginning, but it, you know he does a, it sort of makes a prayer up, doesn't he? But he wasn't there during most of the screaming. But he was very, very concerned that I'd be all right and was I frightened and uh, all his, um, all his uh, concerns seemed to be for my well-being, which I think uh-huh. is extraordinary. Yeah, it's very nice. And, uh, He's the we're... sweetest man. I am just, um, I've just taken part. We're having a gala showing in a, in a film uh, about, it's called Peter Cush- it's a feature film documentary. It's called Peter Cushing in His Own Words. And it's a very interesting film, which is um, going to have a showing here in London on the 8th of February. But um, I think you can get it on Amazon. I think it's on Amazon. And you've got lots of people who worked with him. Valerie Leon, um, Madeline Smith, Derek Folds, all sorts of people talking about their experience of him. And it's a really nice little feature film. Oh, that's very uh, nice. Documentary. Did, if you can get you... it, uh, a lot about Peter Cushing. Mm-hmm. What yeah. is I about was, him? That's what it is. Yeah, I was in London a couple of years ago for the first time. I had a good time there. Oh right. So what what what, what happened then? I was at uh, Fright Fest, which is a big oh. uh, horror movie uh, festival. What in that? Oh, right here. I sorry, I yeah. didn't catch that. I didn't catch that. Oh right. Yes, I know that. That's in Leicester Square, isn't it? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah. It was a very cool experience. Very big uh, festival because it's like multiple screens. Very big festival. Yes, I've never attended it actually. It's in. Le- it's largely in Leicester Square, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, that's exactly where it was. Which was, you can uh, come that over was again. Awesome. Yeah, it was a good time, and uh, one of my friends in England. Uh, um, Showed me around some of the older pubs because a lot of stuff oh, right. is new, yeah. but the uh, the older ones were much more interesting. Yeah, London London's amazing. I think it's amazing. Yeah, I really had a great time. So, did you keep in touch with anyone uh, that you worked with? Uh, you know, in the Hammer films after you left uh, acting. Uh, no, no. That, that's the other thing that sort of happened um, because there was no social media. And no emails and things. I, would, I mean, not just Hammer films, not just the films. With actors and actresses that I've worked with in the theatre, I really regret losing touch with you. You would keep in touch with them for a while um, by mail or phone, but generally you lost touch. Whereas nowadays you wouldn't because you've got Facebook, you've got social media, you keep in touch with all your old friends. But I have met some of them um, at conventions, which has been fascinating. I've got really friendly with Caroline Monroe, whose birthday it is today. So happy birthday, oh, really? Caroline. Oh, and the yeah. reason I got friendly with her is meeting her at conventions. I've done, in the last couple of years, I've done uh, 
three little bits of work with her. And um, yes, I've got to know her, but I didn't know her during the time. Um, Susanna Lee, I met, who lived, who lived in Los Angeles, I met at a convention. We re-met after uh, meeting on Lust for a Vampire, and that was fascinating. Uh, to be sitting next to her at a convention was, was fascinating, and she gave me a copy of her book. But sadly, uh, shortly after, just a year later, she died. I'm, I'm also in touch, yes, in touch, but not so much. I was very good friends with Luanne Peters, who's, who was in both of them, Twins of Evil and Lust for a Vampire. But sadly, she also died a couple of years ago. I'm sorry to hear that. The, um, was it a hard decision to leave acting? Well, no, um, no, no. I didn't really leave it as such. I, did, I'm, <laughs> I don't know if you want to know this, but I met a boy... Uh-huh. who, with, on about our third date, said, how would you like to drive through Africa? Uh, he was from South Africa. So I said, yeah, why not? So off we went on this. We planned this huge trip in a Land Rover, just his Land Rover and me, driving through the Sahara, through Central Africa, right through to Kenya, uh, which was a huge experience. And when I came home, it had taken about six months, and then I worked in the theatre in Kenya for a little while, and when I came home, I really felt my life had changed. And completely fortuitously, somebody told me that they were uh, interested in uh, having a new co- a trainee continuity announcer in a new television um, company that's starting up uh, for ITV in the south of England. So I, um, I went down and met the, the guy who was head of presentation in this television company called TVS, Television South. As I say, it was ITV. And I got the job. So I, I spent the next five years uh, doing that pop-up on television. Uh, the first two years were in vision, in fact, uh, sort of saying, you know, the next program is this. And that. So I left acting, it, 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 you know, I left it just simply to change work. It mm-hmm. still required my voice and my face, but not in quite the same way. Yeah. So I did that, and then I came back to London, and uh, I had married the guy who'd asked me to go to Africa, so we had children, and uh, we moved to South Africa for a while. Mm-hmm. And that, so that's how it all changed. I didn't yeah. really do any acting after that. Then I had my children. And the last uh, 14 years, but I've just retired. I hate that word, retire. retire but I, I've just retired from teaching. I, when I came back from South Africa, um, I, I was teaching for a while. Oh, that's very good. What was South Africa like? It was wonderful. We we went back specifically after the elections, quite a long time after the elections, when Mandela was president, because the boy who took me to Africa just wanted to go home for a bit. He wanted to go home, you know, to a democratic country that he'd never known before. Mm-hmm. So that's what we did. And South Africa was wonderful. The the access to wildlife is phenomenal. Um, I did do a little bit of work there, actually, as an actress, which is rather odd. I did uh, played a psychiatrist in one of their soaps for a little while, but not for long, when I was living in Johannesburg. Mm. Uh, so that was, that was wonderful. It was a wonderful, wonderful, life-changing experience. Africa generally is. And to live there and to uh, drive through Africa, as we did, was a life-changing experience. So that's really why I left acting. Okay. And you couldn't uh, really go back to it. I'd lost all contacts. I'd lost everything. Yeah. I just, I, you, I don't, nowadays, for me, it looks so um, daunting and exhausting. You have to have show reels. You have to. Um, it's very difficult to get an equity card, which we got fairly easily, and um, and uh, it seems to me very very difficult. I, I, you know, I'd absolutely hate to have to do self. Also, you do it for auditions, don't you? Do self filming on your on your mobile phone, which I would find extremely daunting. Yeah, I, I've had, you know, a, a guest talk about that. That's a relatively new thing to, like, send in, you know, like a video uh, audition as opposed to actually being there. I know. I, I've got actor friends. I've got some um, very lovely actor friends who, you know, started more or less when I did. And, um, they, you know, you have to learn two pages of a script just to do the audition, just to um, do do it in your sitting room, you know, to film yourself. I mean, you can go, you can spend weeks uh, learning other people's scripts and, um, you know, you don't get chosen. Um, for me, it's just, it's not uh, what I would like to do now. 
Mm-hmm. I'd just like to get off with the parts, but actually I wouldn't like to get off with the parts because I don't <laughs> think I could do them so well now. But interestingly enough, I've just done a little film, and when I say a little film, it's a lovely film, but I, I got a little part in it because I only wanted a little part uh, with Caroline Monroe, and it's uh, we filmed it in Wales. It's called The Haunting of Margam Castle. It's by a very... Uh, very good. It's directed by a very, very good director, a very prolific director. He does four films a year, feature films, called Andrew Jones. He films them all in very, very efficiently and with a very fine crew. He films them in, in um, Wales, which is extraordinary. That had Caroline in it, doing a, a, also a very small part, but quite a bit bigger than mine. Also, the main actress is a Hammer actress called Jane Merrow. I don't know if you know of her. Mm-hmm. She was um, she was a Hammer actress, and she's playing the lead, along with a very well-known British actor called Darren Nesbitt, older man now. now. And so I, I have just done a little bit of filming, but I didn't have to audition for it. Yeah. Oh, I, I know, I knew, I knew, I heard of this, because uh, my friend Simon Bamford is also in it from uh, the Hellraiser movie. Oh, exactly. I didn't yeah. come across him, actually, but no, exactly, he's in it, yes. Huh, very Indeed. interesting. Was that fun to, yeah. to go back and, uh, and do a small role? That was huge fun. That was absolutely huge fun. We did, I mean, I only did a day. And uh, I had four lines, and I thought, I got so anxious about it. After all this time, I got so anxious. He wrote them specially for me, uh, the, the director, put a little bit in. And I said to him, Andrew, I don't, I don't want four lines. Could you take one of them out? Because I'm having difficulty learning them. <laughs> Not... I might say not because I'm so old, but because I'm so out of practice. I got very anxious. I really got very anxious. But I loved doing it. Loved working with the film crew again, who were all wonderful, dynamic. A lot of young, in fact, young American actors in it. And I can't wait to see it. That should be huge fun. Yeah. Yeah, I'm looking forward to it. Coming out sometime this year. Cool. So when when you started to do the Hammer Horror movies, uh, what did your family and like friends think of you being a, in a horror movie? I guess they're not like really uh, graphic horror movies, so it's a little different. Well, not, I think it was the Americans who brought in the really graphic ones. Yeah, yeah. Um, as far as I know, no, they're not graphic. I can't actually remember that. I can't remember my family. I remember my family coming to see me in the theatre and, and being quite proud. And I did. Um, I did a television soap for. Um, for British television, which was quite famous and on every day of the of the of the week, except for the weekends, and my family were terribly proud of that. They were very very proud when they could see things on the television. I don't remember anything much, but you know, it just was very different. I mean, uh, my my uh, beloved sister died, who was ten years older than me, but she died very recently. And in her, um, I had no idea about this, but her daughter sent me some things that they'd found, which had been sort of cuttings that she'd kept of my, of, you know, when I'd been in the newspapers and things, which I found was very touching. But it never really occurred to me at the time to worry about what my family were thinking mm-hmm. at the time. I mean, I'm not sure they did. I mean, they wouldn't have gone to see the hat. Hammer horror films. I think Hammer horror films are bigger now than they were then. Interesting. So when uh, on that kind of subject, when you go in to do Hammer uh, horror for the first time, like how aware of you were you of the name Hammer Hammer horror? What did that like mean to you at the time? Well, I think we vaguely touched on this earlier on. I, it didn't mean anything to me. I knew uh-huh. nothing about it. I did know, actually, funnily enough, once I started doing it, because there were things we were asked to do. The Royal Variety Club uh, invited Hammer actresses to their annual dinner and things to be guests, to um, talk, you know, chat to people and things. So, and there was a certain glamour attached to it, to events. There were a few public events that you were expected to go to. I don't remember uh, premieres, and I'm not sure they had premieres in the way that we know them now. Um, I, and I don't remember that at all, but I do remember them inviting us to some glamorous events. It all seemed very glamorous. I mean, we weren't paid very well, but the surroundings are very glamorous. We had wonderful costumes. We were treated really well. Well, as I say, we had sort of limousines coming and picking us up for filming and things. Mm-hmm. But, uh, but, but um, it didn't, they didn't really, it was just part of, part of your work, really. Mm-hmm. Uh, Mark, and you went from one us. to the other, and you went to other, and there's a few other Hammer Horror films. Um, I mean, not Hammer Horror, but other horror films. They seem to be popular. Mm-hmm. There was, um, 
for instance, the other sort of film that was going at the time, and my agent had one of the main actresses in it, things like Straw Dogs, for instance. Oh, yeah. That was a sort of a horror film, wasn't it? But that was yeah. of that era. Mm-hmm. Yeah, kind of the you first, like, uh, oh, yeah, it's like the first, uh, what's considered like home invasion uh, jo- subgenre of horror movies. Yes, exactly. Yeah. Such a good phrase, subgenre. <laughs> Such a good phrase. <laughs> I can't. I can't take credit for it. Uh, I would say I. Interesting. Interesting. So tell me about you and your and your webcast here. All right. Well, yeah, we started in uh, 2006. So, the, um, uh, really, when we started doing the show, the the word podcast wasn't around yet. Uh, yeah. uh, the first guest was Sid Haig, who passed away uh, just recently. All right. Yeah. And uh, so I started the show with my brother, who I still do the show with, but he's uh, sometimes not here for the, for the interview uh, portions. And uh, I don't know, it's, uh, through the years, it's really, uh, it's been a lot, a lot of cool experiences. I just did my first feature film uh, with you? people awesome. yeah, with, that I knew through the, through the movie and producing a feature film in February, which that would be very exciting. Yeah, yeah, that's brilliant. How did you get funding for that? Did you, was it self-funded? Was it? Uh, yeah, it's self-funded uh, at the ho- at the moment. Hopefully, uh, hopefully, uh, hopefully not by the time we actually film it. But uh, at the Can moment, you send me details about it. All right. Yeah, I definitely will. It's uh, it's it's been a fun experience. That's how I look at it. If nothing else, it's been a fun experience. Yeah, um, that's what it's all comes... about. That's what life's all about, isn't it? Fun. I, I think you hit the nail on the head. That is definitely my cri- single criterion for when I was working and still, I should say, is having fun. That, that, that's, that's, that is the actual single good thing about doing acting. It was always, always fun. And that's why I felt Mike Raven was a, a bit of a fish out of water there. He didn't seem to enjoy fun. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so, uh, it's a long story, but a few years ago, I got very sick and uh, spent a lot of time. I was very, very near death and uh, spent a lot of time in the hospital and rehab and a physical rehab to get better and then surgeries. And, uh, since then definitely, uh, you know, I know that I'm not here forever and while I'm here, it's good to have a good time and do things like you want to do because you never exactly. know when, when you can anymore. So that's how I look yeah. at it. Well, that's a good lesson to learn from your horrible experience. It's a good lesson to learn. It's exactly right. I, I actually, I completely agree. And I've, I think I've done that. I've never really made huge plans for the future. I find it really difficult to book a holiday months in advance. I, you know, I just prefer to live for the day always. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that sometimes even if like a doctor will say like you know they want you to come back in a year. What are you doing in like April of two thousand twenty? You know, April twelfth. I'm thinking I have no idea. I don't know. That's uh, no, you know, <laughs> that's a year tricky, away from tricky. now. Yeah, no idea. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> Uh, I do wonder if some people do know uh, what they're doing one year from today. Whereabouts in Massachusetts are you? Uh, on Cape Cod. I don't know if you're familiar with Cape Cod. Um, no, I'd love to go to Cape Cod, actually. But uh, my very, very first um, job took me, it was a theatre job, was a theatre job doing three Shakespeare plays. And um, we first of all did them in Bristol in, in England. But the point of the job was it was a theatre tour of America and then Europe and then Israel rather randomly and um, the very first stop in fact I have to admit to it being my very very first flight was to Boston and we played oh, Boston nice. or uh, it, was, it was amazing it was amazing to suddenly arrive in America and be playing in the I can't remember the name of the theater um, in Boston but that was our first uh, that was our first uh, week in Boston you know week for the theater Oh, wow. wonderful! Well, it's wonderful. Yeah, I was just in Boston and uh, Cambridge last night. Oh right, yeah. Of course, yeah. Cambridge is very near, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah, Cambridge is a nice area too. A lot of uh, old theaters there uh, to watch uh, older movies, and uh, and just it's a nice area. It it's when I went to London because people told me like the food's bad in London. I personally liked it because it a lot of it is similar to what I have uh, in the area. You know, shepherd's pie and fish and chips and. That's all very old. 
Neil. That's all very old hat. London has become one of the one of the um, centres of the world, the foodie capitals of the world. I'm afraid, not not fish and chips and shepherd's pie. So you you're you know, but there's some wonderful restaurants, and it really has become. It's right up there. Some people say you know New York, obviously um, less so Paris these days, but and Hong Kong, but um, definitely London is up there with the, with them. Um, you may have heard, or you, um, one of the things I was really chuffed about, I don't know if you know the phrase chuffed, but it means pleased. One of the things I was really pleased with, the Quad Cinema in New York was showing the um, trilogy, the Karnstein trilogy. It was, it was, mm. um, it was redone uh, the summer of last year, I believe. Uh, the Quad Cinema was um, refurbished, and uh, their first season they were showing these three films. And... Um, they showed Lust for a Vampire, Twins of Evil, and somebody, a, a guy who lives in New York and went to see them, sent me pictures of his ticket. And I think that's amazing. I, I really wanted to have fantasies about walking in, <laughs> um, you know, buying a ticket and, and watching these films. Yeah. In, uh, New York, I mean, that is what you started off asking. You, how astonishing is that, that uh, the cinema in New York was showing these films? in a refurbished cinema. So it was sort of um, their opening, if you like. How wonderful. Yeah, that's, yeah, that's amazing. When Have you seen the movies? It amazing. Have you seen the movies, like, uh, recently with an audience? No. <laughs> no, not really. Uh, no, uh, I, I was... Uh, no, <laughs> no, I haven't. I was... In, uh, when, the last, when the Twins of Evil DVD came out, which was a few years ago now, I was invited to a convention, and they were showing... It, they were going to show it at the end of the convention, and they had... Um, three of the actors and uh, and and John Huff uh, on stage to uh, for a Q and A, and then they showed the film. And I'm ashamed to say I didn't watch it. I, I had I had another appointment. I was going out that evening actually, uh, so I didn't see the film. So I haven't seen it with an audience, no. Okay, because yeah, I was you know that's obviously a different experience. To be in New York, I'd, I, I, you know what a treat be in New York, having a wonderful time in New York, and then and then go in the evenings to see these films. But I'm not entirely sure because they're quite often they're on the internet and things. So I'm not sure. I really, I, I prefer to see excerpts, not just excerpts I'm in, but <laughs> but bits. Yeah, I understand. But uh, as opposed to watching a DVD or online, well, having the experience with other people in the theater, I think, would would add to the whole uh, to the whole thing. <laughs> Absolutely. Just that it's not shown very much in the theatre, you know. That's why it's such a pleasure to read that it's being shown in New York. You don't really get them shown. Occasionally there's, um, there's a sort of convention that will show your films and then you'll do a Q&A uh, before, but um, uh, I'm not, I, I haven't done that. I haven't actually done that. I did, I did a Q&A quite recently with... A, uh, with um, yeah, with, but but it didn't. Show, it just showed bits of our films with Madeline Smith, Caroline Monroe. It just showed um, bits of our films. Mm -hmm. Do you think uh, after since you uh, since the haunting of Margam Castle that you would like to do uh, more roles? No, no, I was quite. <laughs> I was quite clear that I didn't really. I, I we did a really daft little spoof. Um, film short film um with caroline again here in london that was huge fun i played a vampire she played a vampire it was a it was a jokey thing um and i love doing that i love doing it. i love to do it small things maybe but not um i'd be too um i wouldn't be sure enough of myself which is unusual because you can probably tell i'm quite confident but generally i wouldn't i'd be anxious about it mm -hmm. i think what what was it originally that made you uh, want to be an actor? Uh, well, I did it at school, and then I went to drama school. And interesting enough, not interesting enough, it's not probably not interesting at all. But you did you had to go from where I came from. From where I came from, you um, had to get a qualification, proper qualification, uh, they, to, to give you a grant to get a, get a grant to go. To, so we did three years in a drama school that gave you a teaching qualification as well, a teaching degree. Now uh, there were some actors. Uh, mo mostly they wanted to be act teachers, I think, but there were people who wanted to be actors but could only get a grant for their to, to do their three years in London from if they had a degree at the end. And you know my contemporary at the time in college 
who I got to know very, very well indeed, but absolutely my contemporary has got a teaching qualification, which will surprise you, is Dame Helen Mirren. Oh, wow. Who was in, in my college, and, uh, and it's amazing because she's so astonishing and, you know, just always getting all these awards and things, and yet she uh, is qualified to teach. Yeah. Huh. That's pretty awesome. Yeah, but um, so, no, that, I mean, I wanted to be an actress. But I wasn't sure that I had the talent, but it just seemed to fall into my lap, really. Mm-hmm. We did three years drama school, and uh, then I've, I got this job that took me to America, my very first job. So it sort of all seemed to happen. It just seemed to happen. Mm-hmm. Now, um, you know, the last few years, uh, like the Me Too movement has, you know, um, uh, seen the light of day. Huge, yeah. The, uh, Huge. Uh, when, when you were acting in movies, did you have any uh, negative experiences with people? No, that, I've thought regard? about this a lot because of the. Because I've thought about this a lot. Um, whether I did, whether I didn't, um, I think I would. I, if I have, I blotted them out. I was always pretty forthright. You know, you can probably tell that. I was always. I was always. A, even in the early days, and of course, seventies were big for feminists. I was always called myself a feminist, even when it wasn't the most fashionable thing to do. And um, I, I was, I was not about to be taken advantage of. I just wasn't that sort of woman. But I'm completely supportive of of all the me. Too. I'm not one of these old actresses. You've got some old actresses who just said, "Oh, you know, you just go on with it, deal with it." I'm not one of those. I think I think it's the most appalling thing that women are put in that position. But um, as far as I remember, I was never put in that position. Um, there was an there was a director. Yeah, I don't know if you know Joseph uh, Je, um, Jose Laraz. Do you know his work? Uh, I'm not familiar. He's a director. He's very cultish and quite popular, but he wasn't very good towards his women actresses, and um, I didn't like working for him. But generally, um, I seem to always feel that I had a lot of respect. Mm-hmm. I had a hinterland, you know. I had. A, I wasn't. I wasn't. Um, I, ha- I had. I always had other interests and books and literature and things like that. And I think possibly any man trying to take advantage would have felt it a bit daunted. Maybe, maybe. I just, mm-hmm. I just, I just didn't have that to deal with. Yeah, well, that's good. that's obviously a good thing. Do you- I suppose it is. Yeah, I mean, I, I think there was quite a lot, which I think is what um, the older women actresses, uh, Catherine Deneuve and people, they just say, just deal with it. I think there was quite a lot of banter. Probably the, the young women maybe wouldn't have put up with today. That that is definitely something that went on. A few comments, a few flirty, um, right? Flirty, well, yeah, banters. It's called in this country. And also, yeah. you know, I never minded that. I always quite liked flirting. Sure, I always, think I you know. Think, uh, there's definitely a huge difference between you know uh, playful with somebody and you know uh, being creepy. Yeah. Oh, definitely, definitely. I'm not sure that all men recognise that. <laughs> No, no. Which, yeah, exactly. I which think sometimes the, I guess. The line. Would, I think it I was guess quite it, easy to oh, for me for a strong character like me. It's quite easy for me to bat off any creepiness, mm-hmm. or to or to give as good as I get. Which I suppose what the, that's what they're talking about and the older actresses. But I think it's absolutely shocking. I mean, all this business that's happened with Harvey Weinstein is just shocking, and I can just imagine it happening, being that vulnerable actress that wants a part. Um, so badly, so you go to his his suite, and he's in a dressing gown, and I can almost put myself there, and um, yeah, I think it's shocking, and I'm so glad he's been called out about it. Yeah, it was, it's him uh, and his walking frame. Definitely, it's really interesting. Uh, uh, it was about six months before, like the allegations came out. I had Richard Stanley, a director uh, from England, on the show. And he predicted that because he had like personal stories working with him a uh, year in the eighties or the nineties, I guess. And, uh, you know, and when he said it, I, you know, I was like, wow, this is, and then, uh, like six months later, it all started to come out. Yes. I'm sure there was a lot of that for years and years and years. There've been a few documentaries, haven't there, where women, you know, a lot of it, and it was discussed and uh, it turns out the sort of all sorts of people like Gwyneth Paltrow, And people knew about it. You know, one of the things that I did when I was young, I think it was Clockwork Orange, but I'm not entirely sure. But I was called to audition for Stanley Kubrick. Mm -hmm. And um, well before sort of video, in fact. 
um, we were, as a young actress, we were asked by the casting director to go into the room early, uh, take your clothes off except for your panties, wear a dressing gown, and go into this room. And um, he wouldn't fly, famously wouldn't fly. Um, Kubrick. So they wanted to film you doing this audition, speaking these lines to camera with, I think, just your panties on. Um, I said, I'm not doing that rather grandly. And I walked out and I'm really quite shocked at myself. But I walked out, handed the dressing gown back to the casting director. And I went back and I rang my union equity and said, there's this American director who's asking young women to do this on film. Mm-hmm. Um, I don't think Equity did much about it, and it did turn out that he was one of the greatest directors in the world. But um, <laughs> right. little things like that were going on, and he would have had a lot of um, films of, of young ladies doing that for his audition, which mm-hmm. is, to me, mine, still, all these years later, a bit creepy. It is, yeah, it definitely is, uh, you know, because... <laughs> You know what? You know, like today, we see so many things get leaked out on the internet and stuff. So you never know, like, uh, you know, what would happen to those videos. Exactly, and that's extraordinary. Uh, and that's also another thing that I think older actresses regret. They, they in the seventies, all the sort of wonderful actresses that you could think of, like Vanessa Redgrave, Judi Dench, uh, Helen Mirren, hugely, all took their clothes off for films and things and um glenda jackson people like that extraordinary actors in the 70s particularly because it's quite normal to take the clothes off you went to um i think i think americans excuse me for saying this but i think americans were more prudish if you went to a beach in the south of france in the 70s girls would be walking around just in their bikini bottoms and and completely unselfconsciously but nobody nobody and i have actually spoken to helen about this helen Mirren. nobody realized that the internet would come along and you could freeze frame all these wonderful sort of nude scenes um mm-hmm. i think we all might have thought twice about actually doing them if we thought that that was going to happen in the future Right. I know there's actresses now of my age who really regret it. Mm-hmm. But I agree with you, though. The Americans are much more prudish. which is weird. We we don't mind, like, a lot of gore and violence, but uh, but uh, sex stuff, uh, people... Are, I think uh, that's right. I think that's right. It's odd. British, the British, or the English, at least, the British... You know, I think have been have had have had their you know they belie their reputation because I don't think they have been very prudish in the past. I think they're not very prudish. Mm-hmm. That's true. I think about it. Yeah, interesting. Do you watch? Do you still watch movies? Or maybe you never watch movies. I don't know. But uh, do you watch? Movies? Um, I do. I love movies. I'm um I'm less keen on going out to the movie. Mo- I get get very irritated by. Oh, you don't need to know this. I get irritated by all the other people in the news in in the in the um cinemas eating their crisps and drinking their drinks. But I do go and I don't see enough. Um, but I um saw that wonderful um Almodovar film. Um, Banderas is up for best actor, I believe. Oh yeah, I know. I haven't seen um, it yet. I it's a wonderful movie, and I also completely loved Once Upon a Time in Hollywood. And there's there's a movie you just could not um, see, you know, to the same uh, viewing pleasure on your television or anywhere else but the cinema. I mean, Tarantino's music and his soundtracks are so amazing. That was, to me, um, complete cinema, Once I, Upon I, a Time in yeah. Hollywood. I agree. I agree 100%. It was my favorite movie of the year. And, uh, yeah, mine too. Mine too. Yeah, it's amazing. I did wonder if it was a generational thing, because I do know some young people who went to see it and didn't get it at all. So I did wonder if because it was, uh, you know, because it was of that generation and the music. Um, so that's also sort of split opinions. Yeah. It's interesting, because I, in, uh, I was in L.A. last month for the movie, and I was walking down Hollywood Boulevard, and I walked by the restaurant that they meet Al Pacino in. And I was like, oh, man, that's in the, that's in the movie. I have to eat here. Uh, so I went in there. But uh, Musso and Franks. But it was just uh, it was just cool to me. I was like, oh, I saw this in uh, Once Upon a Time in Hollywood. So I have to stop here. Oh, wonderful. Yeah, wonderful. Iconic. But yeah, it's and a great also, movie. And also, I didn't it? really like it so much. I shouldn't put my opinion oh, out so much. But the Scorsese, the Scorsese movie I saw, too. Uh, the one that went on for three over three hours. Uh, the recent the one. Also, yeah, the Irishman. Yeah. Yeah, I liked it, but uh, it, it is. I saw it in the theater too. Um, 
Uh, I, I liked it, but I had read the uh, the book before watching the movie. Oh, had you? Yeah, and I do think because I had talked with some other friends that uh, some of the stuff I thought they did well in the movie, but I do think you understand better if you had read the book. If that oh, makes sense. right. Yeah, yeah. A lot of right. stuff with his daughter and stuff, but uh. I don't think it's as good as like Casino or Goodfellas or Taxi No, I don't Rider, either. I don't. I didn't. I, I didn't think that. I was just trying to impress you with my knowledge of uh, of um, topical films. But I did. I, to tell you the truth, but it was a very much a male movie. It uh, was not my cup of tea at all. Not mm-hmm. at all. But I did mm-hmm. watch it. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Uh, it's a horror movie, so you might not be into it. But another one I like this year would be Midsummer. Oh, yes. I, I, that passed me by. I definitely should see that. Mm-hmm. I definitely should see that. The yeah, thing like, is, with television and Netflix and everything else, things ca- seem to come around. So you get, from my point of view, you get true. a bit lazy about going out to the cinema. Um, but, yeah, I want to see that. I, I, that did pass me by at the time in the cinema. Maybe it'll come on the television. Yeah, that's actually what I, I saw last night in Cambridge. Uh, was uh, Midsummer. Because they were playing in oh, the game. Right. I was like, it's, oh. I, I'd already seen it, but my friend Annabelle hadn't seen it. And I was like, we should go see it while it's in the theater. Because it's a very visual movie. And I do think it's it's something that's good to see, you know, in the theater if possible. So, yeah, it's, yeah. Like it, it. Might, might, have, it might have been and gone, but it's, it's not even up for an Oscar, is it? I was going to say, if it, if no, it, I don't believe if so. it got an Academy Award, it might come around again. Yeah, I don't, I don't believe, I don't think so. No. Which, well, it's it last year's like, anyway. Yeah, yeah, it was a uh, yeah, it was this year, but yeah, uh, oh. that's one that a lot of people uh, thought you know uh, should be up for something. Yeah, I look, I definitely look out for it. I, I, I it is one that was on my list. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's a weird or horror. I don't know if you know the movie Wicker Man. Oh, well, a, of course I do. Yes, yeah. it was a long time ago that I saw it. Yeah. But yes, I think I've seen comparisons with that. Yeah, so it's a definitely like a folk horror movie. It's very different than like a, a typical horror movie. Mm, interesting. Oh, yeah. So, uh, if people uh, want would like to follow you on social media, where would they do that? Well, if they want, if they probably don't want to get my political views, but they can follow me <laughs> as you have done, in fact, on Twitter. Otherwise, there's a Facebook page, a fan page, if you please, which which is is quite lively. And uh, you know, I've made a lot of uh, friends on my Facebook f- page. It's called a fan page, but actually it's a friends page, really. Yeah. I mean, it is for people I've never met before, but they all sound lovely to me. All my fans, all my fans uh-huh. seem lovely. I've got Very to know fun. and meet a quite a few. Yeah, that, that's always interesting, isn't it? Meeting someone uh, that you met, like, on social media, then meet them in person? It is. Yes, it is. It's interesting. Yeah. Yes. Oh, yeah, I am on. I am on this. Uh, I was going to say, uh, but I see I, I am on your fan page, your friends page, and because uh, you've okay. even uh, you've even flagged the interview for tonight, so that's good. Oh, right, of course, of course, and then All I'll right. put it on again because it's going out tonight. Yeah. <laughs> I've got Perfect. a few Americans. I've got, I've got a few American friends there. Yeah, and you can listen all over the world, so you don't even have to be... Uh, but you can, yes. Yeah. It's oh, a little oh, late, oh. probably. It's like 1 a.m., but, you know, whatever. Me, you can record it. Can you record it? Yeah, after uh, after tonight, it'll be on what's called podcast, so people can listen to it anytime. All right, brilliant, brilliant. It's, it's what do you do now? You're going to edit this from all my boring bits. Uh, not the boring bits. I've got a. I just got a couple couple time cues I write down here when uh, I had to repeat something because like the audio might have messed up a little bit. But uh, I don't think there was any boring bits that need to uh, edit. <laughs> good, 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 good. But I appreciate you coming on. It was very fun to talk with you. Well, lovely. Lovely to talk to you. I'll definitely be listening, and I'll be following you from now on. And thank you. Thank you for uh, taking an interest. Yeah, thank you. years very- later. And I hope you have a good rest of the day. Thank you very much. And you. And you. Thank you very much.